seconds. Okay. Yeah. Let's find my pointer here. All right. Yes. Um, thank you. So as already mentioned, um, in the next 25 minutes, I'm going to talk about our work on uh, triple oxygen isotope systematics in the hydrological cycle. And as we all know, um, oxygen isotopes of water play a key role for a variety of different applications. So not only do they help us to understand climatic signals and- Jakub, Jakub can I just ask you, it's, uh, uh, at least I'm not seeing your whole slide. Um, oh, you're not? It's, well, it's, it's on the left side, it's cut off. Um, I don't know if it's just with me or... Do you know I can see it fully here. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you cannot, you know, it's. it's... I can see it. You well, can find me. Okay, then just go ahead. Sorry. Well, let me just continue. Okay. Um, yeah, so not only do oxygen isotopes of water help us to understand climatic signals and um, hydrological balances from measuring the water itself, but. Um, also, the understanding of the hydrological cycle is fundamental for uh, understanding biogeochemical cycles, water rock equilibration, and hydrothermal systems, um, as we've just heard from Daniel, and also the interpretation of oxygen isotope signals in orthogenic minerals. So, first of all, um, during this talk, I will stick to the term 17 OXS, which is, as it was already mentioned in the first talk, similar to the Cap Delta Prime notation but uh, the terminology of choice in the field of hydrology since it is defined in analogy to the deuterium excess parameter. So um, when we're looking at uh, the triple oxygen isotope distribution in waters across the globe, we actually see a large variation. And what we observe is that uh, in the range between something like minus 35 per mil and five to zero per mil in Delta 18O, these waters fall on a trend or a horizontal line, which is more or less in agreement with or define the global meteoric waterline, this horizontal uh, trend here. And um, what we also observe is that at, at the isotopically light and at the isotopically heavy tails of global waters, um, uh, we observe a negative 17 O excess. So in case of uh, polar waters, it's uh, values down to something like minus 40 per meg or uh, something in the range of minus 100 per meg at the heavy delta 18 O tail. So um, when we subdivide this plot, uh, and we first have a range of, uh, we look at the range of polar waters. So this is uh, basically the larger reservoir comparably, but um, rather characterized by, by slower and long-term fluxes. And this reservoir actually provides us high resolution climate archives for the past couple of hundred thousand years and uh, is crucial for global climate. And to the right of it um, is uh, a comparably smaller reservoir but uh, with more dynamic fluxes and uh, not only do we have different climate archives here which are for example lake sediments, glaciers, uh, speleothemes and so on but uh, this is also where most of mankind directly depends on the availability of these water reservoirs so this is where the hydrological balancing actually also becomes more important because of this. <clears throat> So we have uh, basically two different environments that uh, have a strong impact on uh, on the negative on the negativity of 17 o excess, which is either here in the Antarctic region or in very arid regions. And uh, yeah, the aim of this work of this talk is to trace the different processes that control the magnitude of 17 o excess and to see what we can uh, learn from the distribution of triple oxygen isotopes. So the fundamental and main driving mechanism of 17 excess variations in water is uh, fractionation during evaporation from a water surface. And basically this is described by the 1965 Craig and Gordon evaporation model, which uh, subdivides the air column in, uh, above, the fluid, above the fluid in a saturated equilibrium layer and a boundary layer where, where actually molecular diffusion takes place. And um, what it dictates is that the humidity gradient between the free atmosphere and uh, the saturation layer uh, triggers the diffusive fractionation. And um, what is important is that both processes have distinctively different uh, theta values, which cause these 17O anomalies. So um, 
both of these values were determined experimentally and provide the fundamental information for uh, understanding mass dependent fractionation of water. And um, the most important point is that this is actually temperature independent. So if we look in the triple oxygen isotope space, uh, we see that um, seawater, for instance, evaporates into the atmosphere and forms this initial atmospheric vapor. And uh, so we have a certain equilibrium component from the saturation layer and also a diffusive contribution. And in total, these sum up to the total uh, evaporation fractionation. And in general, we can say that the lower the relative humidity is, the higher this diffusive component becomes and uh, the higher the resulting 17O excess is in the atmospheric vapor. So we have positive 17O excess in vapor, which is generated. And however, different effects have an impact on this diffusive fractionation and may have to be considered. So one of those and definitely the most important is atmospheric turbulence or wind. And in this model, it uh, diffuses the diffusivity in the boundary layer we observe here, and uh, therefore its contribution to the overall fractionation. So this would result in lowering of 17O excess of the evolving vapor. Another effect that should be considered is the salinity of the fluid that will actually increase apparent vapor pressure and therefore the effective humidity above the water surface. So even though this effect is um, insignificant for ocean water evaporation, it becomes um, rather important for vapor formation above continental brine waters, for instance. And another effect is, uh, or correction that is needed is humidity normalization. So, um, if the air temperature above the fluid differs from the water temperature, we uh, face different uh, saturation vapor pressures uh, between the saturation layer and the free atmosphere. And uh, this is something we have to correct for. And in other words, um, warmer air above the fluid will lead to higher normalized humidity and vice versa. Okay, and um, well, this dependence of 17O excess on uh, humidity conditions has been uh, demonstrated in a study on atmospheric vapor above the Pacific by Uemura and others in 2010. And uh, what they have shown is basically the clear dependence on 17O excess uh, on the humidity conditions. And as you see, this is already uh, plotted against this normalized humidity. And what we also have here is all already the correction for turbulence. So just for comparison, pure molecular diffusion of uh, the 18O bearing isotopal lock would be something like 1.023. So it's a large effect that has to be considered. So uh, let's move on. If this vapor uh, above the ocean is then detected and transported at some point, um, condensation will begin, which is an equilibrium process. And uh, in case of 17 OX is temperature independent, which is then basically conserving the initial 17 OX excess of the vapor phase. And if we trace these processes on a global scale, uh, we first observe um, the initial vapor formation, and uh, then at some point we form the first condensate. And these data are from a study uh, that was published in 2019 on uh, rain collected in Okinawa. And um, what the authors have demonstrated is that um, the magnitude of 17O excess could be used to directly trace back a moisture source humidity above the ocean surface. And this was, so these calculated um, humidity values were then compared to um, actual humidity data that was uh, estimated from uh, backwards trajectories of air masses. So then uh, further transport and removal of water in equilibrium will then result in residual vapor with lower delta 18O, but more or less identical 17O axis variations. And um, yeah, so this is now an example from the Arctic. And however, I would just point out at this, uh, at this slide that uh, Greenland vapor evolved from the Atlantic, not the Pacific, but uh, the systematics are principally similar. And um, precipitation uh, that was reported in this study is then formed again closely, uh, uh, is again closely linked to the 17 O excess of atmospheric vapor, even though some diffusive components may have to be considered at uh, low temperatures, but um, I will come back to that in a minute. So what we see is basically that uh, the 17 O excess of the vapor is still of the same, in the same order of magnitude in uh, the precipitation of snow.
So when we look at the data from that study, we see that um, vapor and snow that were sampled simultaneously show very comparative, uh, comparable 17 access on average, even though uh, short scale variations may lead to a certain disagreement of these data. But uh, for comparison, uh, we have here the, the TRM excess data uh, of the same set of samples. And uh, here we already see the important advantage of triple oxygen isotopes. So as shown here, we basically have the same order of magnitude, whereas in the DXS, we see a clear difference or a systematic offset, which is uh, driven by precipitation temperature. So the precipitation always has a lower uh, deuterium excess than the vapor. So therefore, this requires a relatively, relatively good constraints on precipitation temperatures to derive uh, deuterium excess in original vapor. So when we now look at the other polar samples, we see this lowering of 17 axis in remote and Arctic samples here. And um, this is mainly caused by uh, kinetic fractionation, as mentioned before, um, during uh, synoptic precipitate formation from cold air that is supersaturated with vapor. And well, this here is supposed to represent atmospheric vapor. And um, this supersaturation uh, fractionation or diffusing, uh, diffusive uh, formation of ice occurs at very low temperatures, something below minus 20 degrees. Um, and then this precipitation process is not only driven by, uh, uh, by equilibrium, but also by a certain diffusive component, which increases the 17 O axis in the precipitate. So um, uh, the preferential of and the duration of the 17 O in the precipitate will then lead to successive depletion of the 17O in the remaining vapor and will cause this trend towards lower values. And um, what should be mentioned is that uh, two additional processes were identified as potential mechanisms controlling the 17O axis in Antarctic precipitation. One of them is um, the fractionation during open sky precipitation that was identified in diamond dust samples and um, which commonly occurs in the Antarctic um, when uh, uh, events of temperature inversion occur. So this is um, one other explanation for this uh, negative trend that we observe. And another control on the 17 o axis uh, was uh, suggested by Winkler et al. that this variation here that was uh, observed at Vostok um, may also reflect the input of stratospheric vapor. And since um, stratospheric water vapor has a 17 O axis between two or three per mil, already, already small amounts may have a large impact on that. However, this um, topic is um, still controversial. And um, what I would also like to show is a study of, uh, in the polar area of Allard, Canada, where uh, vapor samples were analyzed and also in addition snow samples. And what, we, what, what the authors observed is actually a large offset of the vapor, but um, actually this, uh, this, uh, this positive offset is uh, not reflected in the alert snow. But however, um, it's unclear whether these vapor samples and the snow samples are related at all because they were sampled in different years. And also what we see here is that, that uh, we should expect uh, a difference in delta 18O between the precipitate and the vapor phase. So that should be it so far for the polar waters. And now I would like to have a closer look on the high delta 18O tail of the global distribution, which is uh, defined by evaporated waters in arid regions. So let's take a step back to the evaporation model and I mean, if we look at uh, continental water bodies that are limited in volume, uh, we know that according to the Craig and Gordon model, um, the 17 O excess preference in the vapor phase will uh, inevitably lead to a decrease of 17 O excess in the uh, residual fluid during intensive evaporation. And uh, while it becomes more and more enriched in 18 O, the uh, 17 O excess will become smaller. And the evolution of the residuals is here indicated by this red arrow. And uh, well, as evaporation proceeds, um, we get more negative 17 O excess or uh, even negative 17 O excess with respect to the seawater reference line. Um, 
So uh, such hydrological settings of these water bodies may differ. So in the first case, for example, we may have pan evaporation, which means that uh, water bodies are periodically recharged and then evaporated without additional influx. So this pan evaporation case will follow, for example, such a trend here as we see in that schematic plot. Um, Another and more common uh, setting is the uh, evaporation and recharge uh, water body. And um, so, I mean, we have two different settings here. We can either have the case that evaporation is smaller than inflow, then we also have to consider some outflow, or inflow and evaporation are equal. In that case, we would have a terminal lake as indicated in this plot here. And I mean, the higher the inflow is, the closer we get to the value of the initial water. And um, what then uh, comes in additionally is the admixture of mixing water and uh, um, the isotopic composition of a lake body before reaching one of these steady states, which would be, for example, the water pulse uh, during uh, spring or something, uh, which will fall on a different trend, which is still lower here. And um, one important thing to point out here is that the curvature of these evaporation trends is uh, driven by, or mainly driven by um, ambient relative humidity, which means that um, adequate parametrization of uh, boundary conditions would allow uh, the reconstruction of moisture source conditions, uh, um, of more, no, not source, but moisture conditions um, at these certain localities. So um, this is a very nice example of these systematics um, published by Vogt and others this year. And um, this actually shows the interplay of um, pan evaporation, uh, steady state, and additional mixing. So what we see is that um, on the one hand, at the end, oh, okay, so the setting was the Altiplano in Chile. And what we see is that at the end of the austral winter, uh, water bodies uh, are supplied with fresh water and fall in the range between steady state and some kind of additional mixing. So this is uh, here the dominant isotopic pattern that we observe. Um, whereas at the end of austral summer, many of these bodies are either not present anymore or cut off from re recharge so that they move along this pan evaporation trend here. And um, well, as I said, uh, Humidity controls the curvature here, but uh, what is also extremely critical is uh, the estimate of the isotopic composition of atmospheric vapor, which um, controls these isotopic endpoints and also these steady states here. So um, it's very important to have a precise estimate of that. And um, well, in this study in that we uh, uh, made in the uh, central Atacama Desert in Ceylon Ponds, um, we tested the sensitivity of evaporation trajectories uh, that were modeled for different relative humidity values and uh, varied the uh, atmospheric vapor composition. And I mean, the values here that we choose here are, are quite extreme, but what we can observe is uh, that the composition of vapor determines whether the resolution of these traje trajectories is even sufficient to uh, provide humidity information at all. And um, well, in our case, uh, we were quite lucky in the specific study since the vapor uh, in the central Atacama Desert is derived from the Pacific Ocean and uh, no additional or no significant additional sources of vapor had to be considered in this hyper arid environment. And um, yeah, the good thing is that such evaporation signatures uh, are then potentially conserved in evaporites such uh, as gypsum, for example, or structurally bonded water in gypsum. Uh, which then can be analyzed and used for paleohydrology studies. And another advantage of triple oxygen isotopes in that case is, in contrast to D-excess, um, that this is not limited to the presence of water-bearing minerals, but can also be applied to other oxygen-bearing orthogenic minerals. Um, yeah, but I won't go into detail here since uh, we will hear uh, more about it in a later talk. Okay, so let's leave the arid regions. And in the last part, I would like to focus on uh, waters in mid latitudes. So here I would first like to show um, two maps of 1708 SAS distribution in uh, tap waters in the US and in China. And um, well, what the authors observed here was that uh, certain samples with elevated 170 O axis 
So this means uh, clearly above the approximately 30 per mech of the global meteoric water line may probably not be explained by uh, variability of the oceanic moisture source or uh, re-evaporation of, of a continental lake body or water reservoir. And um, what they already suggested is that this may uh, likely result from the recycling of meteoric water, which is then um, inherited by, uh, the, by, by, by the second stage precipitation of meteoric water. So in order to investigate these effects, um, we added some 17O data of samples from the Zugspitze, which is the highest mountain peak in the German Alps and located at the ascent of the Alps. Um, so we added uh, values of uh, snow samples and uh, atmospheric vapor that we obtained there um, to the data set. And um, this is where these samples fall on the global scale. So we have the vapor here and uh, the snow samples here. And um, when we zoom in, we see that the vapor and the snow samples are again in good agreement. So that also the precipitation here um, pretty well reflects average atmospheric vapor. And yeah, if we compare it again to the deuterium excess of the same samples, we again observe uh, this temperature dependent offset uh, of the uh, deuterium excess. So um, in order to explain the range of 17O excess and um, the values that are clearly above the global meteoric waterline value, um, we tested possible moisture source variations. So um, air masses that reach the study site are mainly derived from the Atlantic and travel over Western Europe. So we verified this by um, air trajectory reanalysis and then modeled simple distillation of moisture uh, with an Atlantic source for different humidity values. So um, what we see here is uh, a value of 80% relative humidity uh, in these white circles and the gray circles represent 60% relative humidity. And these small numbers here indicate the residual fractionation over the course of distillation. And these blue and red arrows just indicate some other variation at the moisture source. So this would be a temperature shift here from 25 to 10 degrees, and this would be a change in atmospheric turbulence. So a less turbulent atmosphere would lead to an increasing 17O excess. So um, in any case, uh, this model is apparently not sufficient to explain the high 17O excess values that we observed there. So uh, what we did was adding the component of continental moisture recycling to the water balance, including evaporation over Western Europe. So in our case here, this uh, here represents the Atlantic. We have Western Europe here, and um, this here is the ascent of the uh, German Alps. And um, what we included in this model was then um, primary evaporation, re-evaporation from open surfaces, and also a reasonable um, estimates of uh, plant transpiration and so on. And at the end, also some local contribution of vapor. And this is um, basically the outcome. So um, the distillation pattern that we see here uh, already includes recycling of moisture over uh, Western Europe. And um, yeah, as I said, this already considers reasonable assumptions about humidity conditions, surface water contribution, and uh, the fraction of vapor contributed by plant transpiration. And we see that, that this trend still does not explain the high 17O excess of the observed samples, but forms some kind of a baseline. So the lowest uh, 17O excess may somehow be explained by that. But what we uh, also modeled was the vapor flux coming from the actual local snow cover. So the average isotopic composition of the snow cover is uh, indicated here. And um, this is uh, the vapor fluxes coming either in February or May, where we uh, conducted uh, the field work. And um, this also um, includes temperature variations, average uh, relative humidity, and so on. And um, what we observe is that basically these local vapor fluxes may then uh, explain uh, or serve as an ant member to explain the variation of 17O uh, of, uh, axis in atmospheric vapor. And um, yeah, of course, this still depends on, on different contribution uh, of, uh, or, or different uh, factors that have an influence on snow cover. Uh, snow cover evaporation, uh, but um, in general, 
this would help us uh, to explain the variation that we observe by, uh, on the one hand, um, continental evaporation, and on the other hand, uh, a local contribution. So, um, in this case, uh, we would conclude that 17 axis here provides an excellent tracer for balancing this moisture recycling. So, um, two minutes. Yes, so with this, I would also like to come to the conclusions and the outlook. So, um, what triple oxygen isotopes of uh, water uh, give us is a valuable tracer for uh, moisture source humidity reconstruction, as uh, we've seen, for example, in modern precipitation, and what is also um, shown by different studies on ice cores that uh, reflect source humidity variations in the past. And it's also a valuable tool for the reconstruction of ambient paleo humidity conditions um, of evaporating continental water bodies and also for hydrological balancing. And um, yeah, these are just some future challenges that we uh, think might be uh, most important. So first of all, um, the constraints on surface evaporation processes uh, are still improving or still need to be improved. For example, uh, Gonviantini and others proposed uh, the addition of droplet formation into the Craig and Gordon model in a recent publication. And um, another thing that is still quite unknown is the uh, diffusivity of 17O water isotope log in soils, for example, which will also be crucial. Um, what we also need is a bigger focus on 17O axis in atmospheric vapor. So this would mean, um, for example, more, maybe even continuous sampling of uh, water vapor. And this would be enabled by recent advances, for example, uh, of cavity ring down spectroscopy that would uh, provide or would possibly provide um, such records. And um, yeah, as we've seen, the 17O axis of atmospheric vapor is quite important for isotope-based hydrological balancing of uh, continental water reservoirs, and is also highly critical for paleoclimatic uh, reconstruction, as for example, could be done on speleothemes and uh, lakes. Well, and um, something that I've uh, also already mentioned in this talk, and uh, it's still a quite controversial topic, is the role of stratospheric downdrafts and in which way they may affect the isotopic composition of uh, precipitation that we have. So with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention and I'd be glad to take any questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jakub, for your, your interesting talk. And um, are there any questions in the chat? No, there aren't any in the chat box. Any questions from the audience, audio questions? No, it's all clear. Okay. Um, well, I would I would have a question. It's it's regarding the stratospheric contribution to water vapor. Um, my understanding is that the stratosphere ex is extremely dry. Yes. There's almost no water. So how can can possibly uh, um, you know stratospheric contribution um, change the isotope composition? Is it really restricted then to the Arctic regions? not only because of stratospheric downwelling in this region, but also because the atmosphere there is also dry because of the low temperatures? Yes, so this is what I would say, uh, that uh, actually in order to detect something like stratospheric water signal in, uh, in, uh, in precipitation, you would definitely need to choose a location where uh, you have extremely low mixing ratios or extremely low um, contribution of uh, local atmospheric vapor. So this was also something that we, we discussed over the course of, of the study on Zugspitze that could be possible contribution of stratospheric water, but um, in this case the, the uh, absolute concentration of water is simply just far too high to have an, uh, in order to see an impact of stratospheric waters. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, mm -hmm. so I this is something that we can basically exclude for mid latitudes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. okay. Any sharing? Sorry. Um, need to. Okay. Um, well, then, thanks again 